welcoming uh, Maria and uh, Pia who are uh, supporting us um, uh, in uh, running this um, uh, session. And of course, uh, welcome to all the speakers. Uh, there is a number of you, uh, and I believe most of our visitors uh, here uh, have a reason to join and, and are expecting interesting uh, input uh, from uh, the, the panel. And um, before we start, um, I'd, I'd just like to uh, say a few words um, on why this topic and uh, why in this setup. Risk finance uh, and SMEs, access to risk finance, funding for innovative uh, businesses who are uh, applying uh, research uh, results uh, has been the uh, key uh, element of our work in uh, Social Lab 6. Uh, and I will uh, soon uh, give words to Zbigniew Machat, who's been uh, managing uh, this um, part of uh, the New Horizon project. And over the time, uh, and he will tell you a bit more uh, in detail um, how it all worked uh, and, and what the challenges were and how we have uh, overcome the over the time we realized that uh, we are actually uh, finding very interesting uh, uh, developments uh, in terms of private and public funding coming together, being opposed sometimes even. And uh, we, we decided to, to have a, a proper look at this with uh, a wide um, a range of speakers uh, who might uh, shed some light on if uh, you know on the on the key question we are be, uh, will be answering today if these two are actually converging and coming together to uh, bring the best to the society uh, and uh, uh, asking if the responsible research and innovation principles uh, can actually work as a uh, translation uh, medium between the two. So uh, without uh, uh, further ado, uh, uh, let me uh, begin with uh, inviting the first speaker, uh, Zbigniew Machat, who uh, will uh, give you an insight on what has actually been on our plate for those three years of, of uh, the running of the project. And uh, where we stand uh, currently uh, before uh, the the project ends, and what it might actually mean for the future. So, Zbigniew, welcome. Uh, uh, the stage is yours, uh, and uh, this will um, be our keynote. So, good luck there. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to see you all here. It really is a pity that we cannot all meet in person. And I don't want to kick off this session by uh, stating the obvious. Of course, we have all come here to talk about one of the most sensitive and critical aspects of research and innovation. Actually, not one, three of them, of funding, responsibility and impact. I would like to begin by remembering how we got here. In fact, this session marks three years of work on something most people we met along the way did not understand or believe on the first side. When I joined the New Horizon project, the job consisted of mostly just explaining. And uh, it took some time before we realize that it might not be the best approach. It sounds a little bit counterintuitive, uh, but we found throughout our social lab meetings, countless interviews, presentations, and uh, seemingly dead end conversations, that the best way to make the key topic responsibility 
we have to carefully balance between asking questions and explaining. Today, we have to also balance between our passion for details and time we have for our speeches. The aim of our work was not to audit, but to evaluate with the intention of finding out how Horizon 2020 stands in terms of using concepts that are referred to RRI. That entails analyzing documents from strategic level to end user projects. For our area, we have collected documents defining the field of EU activities, strategy 2020, basic, basic documents for Horizon 2020, and other types of policies such as innovation union. We have consistently gathered documents from the internal evaluation of Horizon 2020. For better orientation in our subject matter, we took in to account the situation in OECD countries also. We proceeded to include documents at levels of working program, program level and lower. Simultaneously with the process of work on desktop research, the first research interviews took place. We expected that we meet with the real people but most of our contacts didn't want to meet personally, and we spent a lot of time on phone calls. These interviews we did show mostly some kind of resistance, misunderstanding, or sometimes also ignorance. We reported the results such as you can read on the slide. Their main worries relate to competitiveness and their obligation to be financially successful businesses. The main general question in our area was, how is Horizon 2020 related to the reality in the area of SMEs and innovation in economy? The goal of Horizon 2020 was support EU economy that is lagging behind USA and Japan, namely in innovation. Why? Situation in the investment into research and innovation was and still is unsatisfactory, especially for innovative SMEs and medium capitalized companies. There are, <coughs> pardon, there are several big market gaps in providing the financial resources because the innovations needed for reaching the goals of the policy are usually too risky for the market. The result is that the wider benefits for the society are not fully covered. Why is it relevant for European Commission? EU targets to 2020 were employment, R&D, climate change and energy, education, and combating poverty. EU level instruments were and still are single market, financial levers, policy tools. Access to risk finance as a chapter of Horizon 2020 aim to overcome deficits in, in the availability of debt and equity finance for R&D and innovation-driven companies and projects at all stages of development. And innovation in SMEs provided SME-tailored support to stimulate all forms of innovation in SMEs. The goal was to make Europe a more attractive location to invest in research and innovation. I spoke too much, but I didn't mention uh, what RRI actually is. The shortest defi definition which we used is RRI means the, that societal actors work together during the whole research and innovation process in order to better align both the process and its outcomes with values, needs, and expectations of European society. Text on the slide is a translation from Eurospeak or academic English to marketing claims. What was our main tool in New Horizon projects? <coughs> I mentioned research, but our main tool were social apps. Yes, it sounds a little suspicious. And yes, we did some experiments on people. 
some of the, some of them have lasting consequences. Some of them are here with us today. And I think they will show you to the consequences of joining the social labs later. We organize uh, three social labs. First was held in Prague almost two and a half years ago. We found out that businesses, that business and finance people have uh, no idea about RRI. That didn't uh, surprise us. We found out that they know nothing about Horizon 2020. That surprised us a little bit. When you get funding from uh, someone, you should know about it. When they found out what RRI was about, uh, they mostly liked it. They were able to find many ways to connect it to their businesses. During the second one in Madrid, we found that RRI business and public goals don't have to go against each other. That the same aim can have different text. Impact investment, ethical investment, or social impact investment. And that this is an area that has grown significantly in the recent years. I will talk about it later. The last social lab was unfortunately online. The COVID crisis has begun. The main lesson was that the cyclical economic crisis or the climate crisis are not the only ones. <laughs> we must act respons responsibly immediately. We need to allocate investment in research in immediately. We need to innovate our routines immediately. We need to move forward. So what is impact investment? The Global Impact Investing Network defined, defines it as investment made into companies, organizations, and funds with the intention to generate social and environmental impact alongside a financial return. In which areas can this concept be applied? In short, in all. Arts and culture have the fewest projects, but it's only three less than food and agriculture with the most projects, as you can see on a slide. As I mentioned, we have a conceptual framework in the field of financing how to break out of the trap of the pursuit of quick profit. But do we have goals on which we, we can agree? Many people in the world of finance were surprised to have them not only at EU level. Sustainable development goals have been with us for more than five years. We have resources, we have funding models that are able to take into account goals that other than quick profit. <clears throat> and we have common goals. Thank you, Zbigniew. I, I believe uh, we have a, a the playing field uh, set pretty well. Um, I uh, forgot to mention we will go uh, through uh, the individual speeches first and then uh, uh, delve into discussion into uh, panel discussion so um, please uh, if you if you have any questions or comments uh, use the chat and we will um, get back to your uh, to your um, uh, questions and use them as fuel for uh, for our uh, discussion uh, we are also taking notes um, so uh, don't worry nothing will be lost um, and uh, saying that uh any hesitation i will uh, ask another speaker uh which we are really uh, happy to announce uh, uh miss katarina brunska is joining us um uh, from the eic and uh, of course you know she has a lot to say uh, towards uh, the topic of uh, funding innovation and smes and she has some exciting news uh, right from the epicenter of this ex uh, activity of the uh, uh, European Commission. So, uh, uh what is it, and, and uh, what what news do you have for us?
Thank you. Thank you, Lukash. I had an issue because when I started sharing my screen, I suddenly couldn't see the unmute button. But thank you very much for the invitation, for the introduction, and thank you also to Zbigniew for setting the scene. Uh, I'm very happy that he also mentioned the Access to Risk Finance Work Program uh, under Horizon 2020, through which we managed to support a large amount of innovative SMEs and companies. Um, together with the support from the European Investment Bank and the European Investment Fund. But for today, I actually prepared a different presentation on the European Innovation Council, which I would like to present to you uh, today. So if you have any questions on access to risk finance, we can maybe uh, discuss that later. So as, as Lukas introduced, I work in the recently established European Innovation Council and SME's executive agency, where among other programs, we are responsible for the implementation of the European Innovation Council. The EIC is the most ambitious innovation initiative ever, with 10.1 billion euros of dedicated funding uh, to support breakthrough technologies in Europe. It is a unique program um, in its efforts to combine new initiatives or initiatives that have not been combined before. A DARPA-like approach to advanced technological research combined with an innovation accelerator for startups, SMEs and for scale-ups. So the, the main instruments of the EIC, there are three of them. Um, covering the full range of technology readiness levels with different type of funding, but with similar or a number of common features that, that you can see here, which are their mission to identify, develop and deploy high risk innovations of all kinds uh, from different sectors, uh, from different areas, but to those that are focusing on breakthrough, market creating and deep tech innovations. The business, business acceleration services are there to support all of the projects um, and help them to, to really work on their areas, uh, on their innovations and get them to the market. And all projects also will have a proactive management from our program managers, uh, depending also on, on their stage. And of course, it's really important to, to say that the EAC is not working in silo, in isolation. We have developed cooperations with other programs, such as the European Research Council uh, or the EIT and its KICS. And we also plan to work with uh, programs at national level. So you can see the three instruments, which are the Pathfinder for early stage research on breakthrough technologies, transition activities, which are actually a novelty of the EIC under Horizon Europe, and they will support uh, technologies to mature uh, from proof of concept to validation. And then the EIC accelerator program, which is there to develop uh, and scale up deep tech um, deep tech technologies. And this is the program that I want to talk about uh, a bit more now. So the EAC Accelerator supports startups and SMEs uh, that seek to scale up their high impact innovations with potential to create new markets or disrupt existing ones. All these innovations should be building on scientific discovery or technology breakthroughs, although we do also support uh, more um, innovations that are based on incremental impact, uh, impact, impactful incremental and social innovation. All these overall are innovations that need significant amount of funding over a long period of time and which are too risky for private investors to support alone. So from this perspective, the, the support from public finance is important to de-risk the investment and crowd in other actors especially private investors. When applying to the EIC, and if you are successful, companies can receive a different type of funding and also in different combination. We hope that those that will be used the most uh, is the blended finance um, approach or the blended finance element, which combines grant uh, and investment component. The grant should be used for, for the developing the innovation, while the investment is more for the deployment and scaling up. Companies can, however, also 
receive or request grant first if the innovation still requires a lot of work to validate and to, to demonstrate. There is also possibility for grant only, but only in the cases where the applicants can prove that they have sufficient means uh, to actually uh, get the innovations to the market. And there is also possibility for investment component only, but only in the cases uh, of rapid uh, scale up of the high risk innovations. And this is mainly um, for mid cap companies, small mid cap companies, which are now also eligible to receive funding under the EAC and which cannot apply for grant component. So to tell you a bit more about the actual uh, support you can receive. Uh, in terms of amounts, these have not changed from the EIC pilot that we piloted under Horizon 2020. So the grant component remains up to 2.5 million, uh, covering 70% of the eligible costs. Um, and the investment component is once again from 0 0.5 up to 15 million. So altogether, um, in the case of blended finance, uh, our, the EAC beneficiaries can receive up to 17.5 million of funding. The investment component usually takes the form of direct equity or quasi equity, uh, where the EAC fund through which the investment component is provided uh, takes between 10 to 25% of the voting shares of the company. And it's also important to highlight that we provide patient capital. So with a longer term perspective of seven to 10 years on average with maximum of 15 years. So since the investment component is really the, the breakthrough innovation itself of the EIC, I wanted to delve a bit more on, on this point. Um, the investment component, as I said, is provided by the EAC fund, which was set up in June 2020, and it is uh, fully owned by the Commission. The Commission is the shareholder, uh, and it is the first time that we are actually investing directly in companies that are at early stage, so seed, startup, or, or scale up. And the EIC fund also reserves follow-on funding um, to invest in subsequent series and really help the companies uh, to grow. And as I said, we target minority ownership, um, except in cases that are identified by the Commission as of strategic interest for the uh, EU, which, for example, can be cybersecurity. If well, in terms of application and evaluation, um, there are some novelties in, in the process. Um, for the, what is new under Horizon Europe is the fact that uh, companies can first submit a short application and that is um, assessed by remote evaluators. And if they receive a positive assessment, a go, uh, let's say a, a go assessment, then they are invited to uh, uh, to submit a full application and they receive a help with their preparation of the business plan uh, through our AI tool and coaches that are, that are available there for, for the applicants. The full application is once again assessed in two steps. Uh, so we continue this from the EAC pilot. The first step is a remote um, evaluation by evaluators against the uh, assessment criteria. For the highest ranking proposals, uh, these, those are invited to pitch their innovation in front of the EAC jury members that are composed of investors, entrepreneurs, or specialists in the innovation field in the various sectors that we are supported, supporting. Once selected, once and if selected, first the company signed the grant agreement, and then in case of the investment component, uh, they have to go through a due diligence process, technical due diligence, and if the entire process goes well, then they are invited uh, to also sign the investment agreement. The call uh, for the EAC accelerator is open and running with two cutoff dates uh, this year and more cutoff dates, of course, to be um, in, um, opened uh, for 2022 and for the subsequent years. So for those who are interested, 
um, there is still time to apply for the 16 June cutoff, but much more time to, to apply for the cutoff on, um, on 6th of October. And that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Katarzyna, for, for uh, an overview and the uh, valuable insights in how uh, the, uh, you know, the EIC is thinking. And uh, one of the key uh, moments in your presentation uh, was the term uh, patient capital. That's something that uh, uh, your uh, follow-up uh, speakers were, uh, will um, definitely uh, also um, uh, talk about maybe using different words, but uh, definitely uh, um, touching on uh, the sensitive uh, moment of uh, how fast profit is uh, supposed to be uh, brought in, um, or at least uh, the self-sufficiency of uh, innovative companies, not to mention those who uh, focus on impact actually. Uh, to move on, um, I will now introduce uh, the managing director of our home institution, uh, uh, the technology agency of the Czech Republic, Mr. Martin Buncek, uh, who uh, will bring uh, the focus on um, a more, uh, uh, you know, local level on, on a level which, which actually touches the base with uh, individual individual uh, projects and researchers in uh, the thinking is similar or different. Uh, Martin, the stage is yours. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I would like to tell you something about our agency as uh, we are heavily focused on uh, responsible research and innovation supporting in the Czech Republic. Uh, let me shortly introduce uh, the technology agency. We are a governmental agency uh, supporting applied uh, research and uh, uh, somewhat also the innovations. Um, we were established uh, about 12 years ago when in the Czech Republic there was a through external evaluation of uh, the R&D uh, landscape in Czech Republic and uh, R&D policies. And one of the uh, obstacles identified uh, was uh, the absence of uh, support of applied research and, and, and uh, the, the uh, small impact of uh, research investments in the Czech Republic mostly from, from, the, public, uh, from the public money. And one of the uh, things uh, that uh, uh, the, the government uh, tried to resolve was uh, the establishment of uh, the agency, the sister agency for the pre-existing uh, grant agency supporting mostly basic research. Uh, and that was the technology agency. So we are now, uh, we are now responsible for uh, supporting and running the programs uh, for uh, the uh, applied research and innovations. Here are some uh, short uh, um, introduction uh, of uh, the agency in numbers. Uh, so far, uh, we have invested 1.5 billion euros in the uh, research and innovation projects in different programs. Uh, in reality, it was uh, 12 programs. Uh, we have more than 3,000 uh, funded projects. Uh, and in these projects, we have uh, uh, the uh, more than or uh, 3,000 uh, businesses and uh, more than 4,000 research organizations participating in the projects. Average funding intensity uh, that is uh, slightly different in different programs, of course, uh, is uh, 69%. And then. Uh, Again, some numbers. I am in the agency from the beginning, and uh, one of the most challenges was uh, from the beginning how to deal with uh, the collaboration between the academic institutions and the businesses. 
And that's, uh, I'm really uh, glad uh, that after 12 years, most of the projects funded by the agency are done in collaboration. So mostly all the projects, nearly all the projects are done in collaboration. And also the numbers uh, here uh, reflecting the situation. So uh, there are similar numbers of uh, participants from the enterprises or businesses and from research organizations. We are heavily involving uh, uh, the public universities, other public research institutions, as well as the Institute of the Academy of Sciences. Maybe you know that in Czech Republic, there is uh, the so-called uh, very huge uh, Academy of Sciences. There's a governmental organization, uh, mostly for, uh, for, for the basic research. And uh, you see also the money flowing, the, the, the public money flowing to these institutions through our projects in our programs are nearly the same. And uh, based on these uh, uh, collaborative projects, we are attracting uh, the, uh, per, uh, the, the, the business money as well. Uh, so there are uh, at least uh, those uh, one quarter of uh, the overall money uh, flowing from the businesses uh, investing in, in the joint projects. Uh, of course, the responsibility, and we, we, we took it very carefully from the beginning, and we see uh, the, the, the responsible, the, the support of responsible research and innovation in the evaluations and in the knowledge of, uh, of the environment of, uh, we, we are working for. So uh, we are involved in many projects, uh, maybe First of all, I uh, have to mention uh, the PAFTI, uh, that's uh, the uh, collaborate, collaborating uh, innovation governmental agencies around the Europe, now not only from the Europe, but also from associated countries and uh, also uh, the countries like Brazil and, and so on. And uh, we are, uh, on the level of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, the administration, we are collaborating as the agencies, we are sharing the experiences, not only the good experiences, but, but also the bad experiences we have. And we are running also the internal projects in our agency. Uh, I should mention also the programs uh, that are uh, focused on different topics. And uh, I would like to mention especially uh, two or three programs. Two are uh, finished now, and one is the, the new program continuing in, 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 this, uh, in this way. And it's program ETA and program ZETA. Uh, in these programs, uh, we involved heavily uh, the, the responsible research and innovation principles. Uh, the program ETA is uh, based on supporting the applied research and innovation in social sciences, humanities, and arts. And that's very, uh, very interesting as uh, we are here uh, talking about, and I think uh, Professor Block uh, mentioned in, in, in the, uh, in the uh, chat that uh, we are talking about uh, the RRI principles in, in investments and in businesses, and also the social uh, sciences and humanities are very important in this uh, in this field, uh, uh, and and we have uh, we are running the program at that. We are uh, we are supporting the projects uh, when the social sciences, humanities, and humanities and, and arts as well are collaborating with the technology uh, companies uh, involving these uh, topics. And the program Zeta, that's uh, the program supporting uh, young uh, scientists. Uh, 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 involving the companies as well. And the program Sigma is, uh, is continuing in, in this way uh, as a new program uh, that we are discussing with the government uh, now. Uh, the impact evaluation is uh, uh, the core of our uh, evaluating culture. Uh, now, as uh, some of the programs after 12 years are, are finished in the agency. We have uh, a few uh, 
uh, final evaluation of the programs uh, in which we are focusing on the impact evaluation as well, uh, of course. And uh, uh, the, the knowledge of the environment is very important for us, as, as I said. And we are running uh, for, a, uh, I think now for uh, eight years, the project INCA, that is mapping innovation capacities in Czech Republic. Uh, we involved uh, at nearly 1,000 uh, innovative companies. Uh, it's done by structured guided interviews with the owners or, uh, or managing directors uh, of these companies. And uh, that as, as, as the, uh, the interviews are structured, we have uh, some overall uh, very interesting uh, uh, answers to some uh, questions about the innovation in Czech Republic. Uh, and uh, also the programs we are developing and evaluations are stemming from the results from, from the uh, mapping of innovation capacities of the INCA uh, project we are running. So uh, that's uh, all from uh, the agency. Thank you and I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, we are uh, following a very interesting uh, line here of you know coming to the uh, responsibility and impact uh, topics, and I believe that's um, a very uh, hopeful uh, uh, tendency, uh, which uh, apparently is is uh, really. Um, coming as a name for something that sometimes has already been there uh, and i believe uh, this is a very hopeful moment also for the actual uh, business owners and and founders uh, such as uh, radek Hushek, who's coming uh, to the stage uh, now uh, and i believe um, we are actually and now i'm hoping to uh, uh stimulate your your thinking you know uh before we uh reach the discussion point uh, uh that um the 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 idealistic part uh in all of us uh is uh, actually having a chance and even though we live in a in a world of um uh, of money and and hunting profit you know this is still something and is becoming more important in, in with the, with the uh, as the further we advance um, uh, of something that that might result in a in a real uh, and sustaining uh, a change in how business can be done and what it can do for the society so radik uh, how, what's your experience what do you do and and how is uh, how is how are you <laughs> uh, after years of trying really hard to to do business responsibly? Uh, we're we're really really keen on hearing, and uh, we are of course moving to the to the, uh, to the to the second group of people we have here from funders to the actual SMEs. So uh, let's listen carefully. Okay. Thanks, Lucas, for for it for inviting me. Let me just share my screen first. Uh, so. yeah, looking good. Let, let's let's go. Okay, yeah, so so uh, yes, we are a uh, few years in and um, and I I sometimes call it that we really started from the ground. So I will I will be talking from uh, the perspective of startup experience. Uh, and I see us as really that we were putting uh, in marketization, we were really putting decades of research of scientists in sustainable protein. So let me let me briefly talk about the problem that we are solving. I think many of you have heard about meat and one one steak actually can in uh, the numbers, for example, done by the United Nations. Uh, can it equal to uh, water consumption of something like 10 hour shower. And uh, since nobody showers that long, we were really looking for some, some, uh, some solution. 
And actually, um, what we are working on is, is a cricket protein or insect protein, which is the same quality protein as beef, but much less water. Also for last year, it's safe and pandemic free. There are no illnesses that we can catch. And uh, this is not just our idea. Yeah? We really started from a book done by United Nations in 2013. Last year, this quote on the left is really from uh, actually from the FARC, farm to fork strategy by European Commission. And let me just briefly show you how it looks. Um, uh, we are on the mission to heal the food system and we want to do it by making crickets really the cheapest meat quality protein source on the market. And that's why we started this kind of farm. So in vertical farms, we're farming crickets. And uh, this is how it looks. Um, we process them into a powder that is very high in protein and we use it in nice looking products. So uh, we are also doing this education part really of the whole, of the whole research that is also uh, in the core of our company. And uh, yeah, we're just like, we're just making it uh, look nice and useful. And uh, how did we start it? It was actually not that easy task. Uh, I have one personal experience about funding. Um, and it was in 2016 in San Francisco after we pitched to uh, a, a ju jurors, one of the investors really uh, it almost like stopped the whole thing and said, I don't care about this, burn it all, where's my money? And uh, I think, I don't actually think that it was meant as a joke. And um, I think it would not be possible to say this, something like this in 2021. I think somebody would like try to sh shush the person down. Uh, so this has changed a, a bit, definitely. Like there is a si significant change. And I would, I would call it like this, that, okay, okay, we believe it can be profitable. So when will you make money? That's, uh, that's something like a quote that would summarize our funding in 2019. We're mostly like we're only funded by private, uh, private funding from VCs. And uh, it's just, um, they like us, they kind of do it also from the perspective of doing something nice. So they are looking at us a little bit differently, but still it has to really make money. So they see it more as a longer term, longer investment term in which they basically are betting on the mega trends. I think investors now believe and uh, understand that the world will change, uh, but still like we need to be profitable next month or like we need to have a clear path to profitability. So uh, this is not that easy to do. Uh, for example, uh, this is a quote from news so that when we started in two, something like 2015, we first time heard about novel foods. Uh, we're really in a new food market. And um, we thought that in 2015, it will be done in like 2017. And four years later, just actually last month, uh, EU legalized fully in all EU member states, uh, insects uh, for food consumption for the first time. So we are really kind of on uh, on like longer path and i just believe that um future investors will more and more ask about what is your uh impact and then kind of divide it with the, with the profitability kind of like 3d model and i think we just need to see more ways how to measure impact so we are looking now as sense foods into like uh, counting our co2 being climate neutral being certified b corporation or kind of even making i really like the b corporation metrics and we want to take it and for example use it only on environmental uh, cha um, uh, challenges which are uh, which are more pro pro prominent now and really measure the impact as soon as possible so yeah this was the startup experience and uh, thank you for your time. Uh, Radek, I, I, you were a, just like uh, the, 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 the right startup founder used to very short pitches. Uh, you were a bit faster than, uh, than necessary. So thank you for that. Thanks, thanks for, for keeping us from sliding uh, in the, uh, in the, behind the schedule. Uh, so we still have a, a, a few seconds. 
<laughs> few seconds to for for a quick question so you know uh, being responsible in general terms uh, is not a hindrance to your business it's more of a fuel for you is it am i am i sensing this right it's it's in our core business so we really see it like uh we say it a lot of time that if we just didn't care about the mission we would do things differently so it's fuel for the team it's fuel for the for the for the really mission part of the of the daily work uh but but yeah we just see it in, in the core and we saw it as a challenge when we started sense we knew that it's it, we're selling bucks to people as food so that's not very common and we knew that it's going to be hard we thought it's going to be a little bit faster but uh hopefully uh that will not really harm us I see okay well i'll i'll keep myself uh, uh, on, on, on schedule and, and leave those questions that are popping up in my mind uh, and definitely not only in mine, I believe, uh, uh, for the discussion part. And I would like to introduce uh, Miloš Lukačka, uh, a, a seasoned uh, startup uh, a co-founder and, and uh, uh, currently um, uh, a representative of um, the private investment community here. Uh, so uh, Miloš, how do you uh, understand the uh, role of this mega trend that uh, Radek um, called it of, you know, impact and responsibility? How does this relate to your day-to-day -day practice? So thank you. Uh, I will get to that definitely. Uh, as, you, as you said, it's a, it's a bit big topic also in the in the private community. Uh, on one side, because uh, private investors are reliantly depending on investors' money, and these investors start to, you know, also care about the, the impact of their investments. So this is this is one side. The second side is also the activity of, of uh, entities like European Union and European Investment Fund, who who uh, <clears throat> directly or indirectly support uh, companies that are um, impactful in, in these matters. So uh, I would like to share two two examples from from. Uh, the professional life uh, about uh, or connected to, to impact investing. Uh, so when I talk to people about in, impact investing, they, they, they tend to uh, ask me the same question. What is it and, and how do you measure it? And how do you how do you know someone is impactful? And how do you and, and the follow up question is, if I am a municipality or a county or a country, how am I to distribute supporting funds to, to certain businesses? How do I know, you know, give me a metric. So in the first part, I will I will share my, my, my thought process on how you can create a metric, actual metric for for impact investing. So as as a as a uh, uh, model company, I actually took uh, a bike sharing company uh, because I was actually talking to to one recently, and it was no other than than Ricola from from Czech Republic. So we had a talk about how to measure impact uh, of of their product of their company. So let's let's first. You know, set the stage. So, so it is a bike sharing company. You know, they have very, very nice and test to finish products. They have very good onboarding process for clients. They can uh, download an app, uh, come to a bicycle, scan a QR code, rent the bike, finish the bike ride, pay by cart. That's it. Simple, easy, uh, and uh, very clear of what the company is actually offering the the, the clients. They have very nice user base. Uh, they have very good retention. People actually, you know, return to the to the same service. And uh, it's a very hot market segment, very hot. Uh, on the other side, you know, the scalability of the solution is not that easy. You know, moving from one city to another, it's not that easy. You have to spend a lot of capex uh, you, you, and you're reliant on the seasonability. You know, you, half of the or quarter of your year is basically non-existent for you, depending on revenues. So this is, you know, some pros and cons of, of this project. And uh, if I were to assess this company as a purely, in, in purely business matter, this is what I would, you know, check. And this is what I would uh, care about. I would care about the, the customer monthly month growth rate. You know, how much customers do you gain every month? What's your redemption rate? How many customers do you actually stick to your to your to your uh, product? Uh, how long does it take for them to to start using your product? The boarding time. What's their lifetime value for you? How much money do you get from each customers? You know, what's the segmentation of the customers and stuff like this. Basically, basic business uh, metrics. You know. Uh, lifetime value of one bike, return on, on your ad spend, how much do you need for an expansion from one city to another. 
uh, and uh, how much the seasonality impacts your, your revenue. So th these are the basic questions that comes to my mind as, a, as an investor or as a business part, potential business partner of, of this kind of company. So uh, everybody knows this. Everybody knows how to, or, or people in this business know how to, how to assess a company like this. They come up with these metrics immediately. They know. They know. However, when we come to, to, to measurement of the impact, not the, business, not the business side, but the impact side, it's not that clear and people cannot uh, imagine it very very like clearly and and immediately so so let's let's talk about, uh, and let's think about let's uh, let's let's study how can we measure impact on this specific company in practice so first of all what, what comes to our mind how does bike sharing uh, a company impact uh, uh, a city or an area it by reducing co2 emissions you know that's that's the first thing that you come up come up with okay that's fine but how much you know how to measure it and uh, what is the actual impact so let's take for example new york city new york city uh has several means of transport people use every day uh, we can close it down to public transport cars and other means like walking or cycling or i don't know you know uh running or even swimming uh and uh, by taking a look into some, some of the studies on this matter, we can see that every passenger can produce uh, roughly 20, 170 grams uh, CO2 emissions per kilometer used on car. On car. And this, this includes the CO2 produced by manufacturing the car, actually. Uh, when, you, when we ch check the bus, it's 100 grams, so it's almost three times lower. Underground is actually 120. Again, this, this includes the, the CO2 produced by manufacturing the actual train, manufacturing the electricity that is needed for, for the train to operate, etc. cetera. So, uh, and bicycle, when it, it comes down to roughly 21 grams of CO2 produced per passenger per kilometer. These are, these are estimates done by scientists uh, much wiser than I am, and I'm just taking their data. Now assume that, that every citizen uh, use public transport in 60% of, of cases when they're commute, car in 20% cases, and walk or bike in 20% cases. This is actually uh, a very, um, I would say, normal breakdown on, and this, this applies to majority of, of Western civilization cities. And uh, by applying simple math, we can see that if a person, uh, average person, would switch from their public transport or car, they can save on average 120 grams of CO2 per kilometer. And uh, so this is immediately a metric that you can apply to, to your, to your, your uh, product. You can, you can measure how many people do you have, how many kilometers do they go, uh, or, or how many kilometers do they use uh, your, your bikes for every, every day. And you can you can come up with uh, with a rough or or not rough but exact uh, uh, number of how much emissions do you actually save per day per, per customer or in total. Uh, just for your um, just for your imagination, what this actually translates to: uh, New York City or New York yeah New York City uh, daily produces roughly uh, seventeen point eight kilograms of CO two emissions per person and uh, 4 million New Yorkers commute every day, which is half of the population of the New York City, uh, a short distance that is, which is eight kilometers on average both ways. And let's just say that our company uh, target uh, as a bike chain company is to, uh, pers pers you know, these 4 million uh, commuters, 20% of them use cars, 60% of them use uh, public transport and 20% of them uh, walk or bike. Let's say we want to transfer the 80% 80, 80 of the people using cars on, on transport and, and take 7% of them and switch them to bikes. This is our long-term goal and we want to achieve this. We want to achieve 7% increase in bike usage during commuting. And again, using uh, simple math, it, it, this, this uh, translates to uh, uh, lower, lowering the CO2 production of New York City by 70,000 tons yearly, which is actually 0.14% of its CO2 emissions. So uh, it is a, is it a lot? Is it a, is it not a lot? This is not for me to say, this is for the legislators to say, this is for the regulators to, to say, 
but we come up with a metric, we come up with a, with a model how to measure our impact uh, on env environment specifically in this specific case. Uh, uh, as, you, as you might imagine, the, the, the public, transport is, uh, public transport is not as you know, big of a problem in cities like New York City. Actually, actually uh, the, the CO2 production of New York City is lowering over the last 20 years every year. Uh, the main uh, CO2 production comes for, from the from the uh, uh, from the sorry from the sea travel from the you know uh, logistics uh, and also from the uh, 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 energy sector and from the industry sector. So this is one way of think or, or looking on impact measurement. The second one is health benefit. You know, of course, people that bike to car to work every day have positive impact on on their body than than people that take train or, or use car. And uh, when we look into some studies, actually uh, pure mode cyclists or mixed mode cyclists uh, tend to have roughly 40% lower risk of developing uh, cardiovascular cancer or, or other diseases uh, co connected to uh, having a sedentary life. So uh, again, I, I don't have enough uh, knowledge in this area, but uh, definitely it can be translated again into a, a metric how our uh, product increases or uh, the quality of life of our users or decreases their uh, potential health, health problems or risk of health problems. And the second, uh, uh, sorry, the third possibility how to measure impact is actually increased production of the, of the companies or of the people, sorry, of the people that use our product, you know, uh, from various um, polls and questionnaires uh, used on very variety of the, of, of uh, countries and cities around the world, uh, we have results that, that roughly half of the cyclists, the people that switched to cycling to work have reduced, uh, reduced stress. Uh, and when we look into uh, company uh, records, actually cyclists have uh, roughly 36% fewer ups and days on average. So uh, in this matter, also cycling, uh, cycling to work, commuting by cycling transfers to uh, better production due to having less stress or having less diseases, it's, uh, ergo uh, having less or fewer ups and days. So these two, uh, let's say, health benefits and or or increased production can also be translated uh, for to into some metric and be be used as uh, is it qualified for for impact measurement. So uh, this is uh, an idea or or or. Some, some of my ideas how to actually measure uh, impact or, or how to create models or, for, for impact measurement. Of course, these models can be uh, developed deeply. They can go much into depth than I went. I spent only a few hours on this. So if I, if I were uh, to, to have you know, a few months with, with actual uh, ability to do some testing and some questioning of the, of the actual users of my application as a bike sharing company, I would come up with another vari variety of, of uh, uh, metrics for, for impact or health or social social uh, or measurement of this, this impact. So this is what, uh, in my mind, uh, is impact investing, or, or this is how would you actually measure it, because you know something by measuring it. And uh, the second thing I want to I want to share with you is uh, that. Uh, the impact investing doesn't have to be doesn't have to be only you know done using subsidies or done for you know for some public good. Impact investing can be actually quite profitable. And uh, one of our main products we are currently working on, or we currently actually finished, and now it's being tested. And uh, uh, actually, we already finished testing, and uh, now we are starting its mass production. Is a fermentation container. So. Uh, as you might know or might not know, uh, the legislation of the European Union for, for uh, 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 pro processing of bio waste, which means all kinds of food from uh, hotels, restaurants, all kinds of, of uh, grass or, or other uh, bio waste of municipalities, all waste of agribusinesses uh, that is also, you know, um, uh, they, that have stock, uh, that have uh, um, animals, or that grow grass or, or other, other uh, bioproducts, all of them need to process their bio waste in a certain way. You know? And uh, for these companies, it's quite expensive. They have 
uh, average business every average business in this area in Czech Republic have roughly 100 tons per month of this waste and currently they have to pay quite a hefty fee for getting rid of it in in this large compost composting uh, uh you know uh, factories manufacturers that, that are ar around the country uh which is which is uh not not ideal for for them so we we come up with a with a with a <coughs> sorry with a product which is a fermentation container this container uh looks very simple from outside but inside there is a very very uh, uh sophisticated um i would say system of pipes and different types of ventilation and and, and heating etc which can actually decompose 40 tons of bio waste in seven days uh these 40 tons uh, would take to decompose six to eight weeks on average uh, in, a, in a high level or high capacity decomposing plant. <clears throat> and uh, actually companies that process their bio waste in, this, in, in our fermenter, they can use the, the, out, the, the out product as a fertilizer. We actually supply them with a with variety of recipes uh, depending on their, on their main product. So if the company is growing, I don't know, wine, uh, we can give them a recipe for a very efficient wine of fertilizer. If they are growing, I don't know, sunflowers, we can give them a recipe for sunflowers that is fertilizer, etc. And this fertilizer is very high quality, is 100% bio, and uh, and uh, also increased with increased efficiency. And so only by reducing the or, or saving the cost for waste management for the com co companies, this fermenter pays for itself in one year. And the uh, and the lifetime uh, uh, the, the the lifetime of this fermenter should be around ten to fifteen years, depending on the business. This this fermenter is also suitable, as I said, for municipalities, hotels, uh, tourist resorts. You know, also companies that that you know uh, process uh, waste in general. And uh, and the legislation the legislation going forward is is actually giving us better position from month to month because. Uh, as we know, waste management is a big topic in in uh, in all around the world, and uh, uh, bio waste has its great advantage of being actually very well processed, and the outcome being also uh, quite useful. So we took. We took I need uh, to I need to uh, uh, ask you to to, to yes? wrap it up. We're, yes, we're running out of time. Sentence. So, so uh, as I said, this is, for example, a, a, a product of. of uh, impact investing that is actually profitable without any other subsidy. And uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, uh, that was the last sentence we actually we actually needed. Uh, and, and it takes the wind from my <laughs> questions I've been noting here. So social impact is a thing that would be the answer for my question, if it actually is. And uh, again, uh, being responsible in the widest sense of, of the, that uh, where it is not a hindrance to your business, but actually uh, uh, an um, uh, accelerator or a uh, catalyst, so to Definitely. say. Thank you. Um, well, um, let me uh, uh, transfer the the word now uh, right to the the last speaker uh, we have with a with a short presentation, but a, a big uh, message, and that's uh, Jan Nekovar, who's joining us um, from the. Czech Moravian Highlands, uh, where he moved from uh, from uh, the metropolis of Prague, uh, which I'm saying with a full uh, understanding of, of how impactful that was on his understanding uh, of uh, uh, being responsible, uh, caring for uh, the uh, the countryside and and the nature in, in in general so uh jan um how did it go we some of us remember you as a representative of a so to say traditional uh or conservative uh business incubator business accelerator um now your uh, name is appearing in connection uh with uh, uh water um, uh, pre uh, prevention of of, of, uh, of drought uh, and and other uh, uh, very well uh, different activities. So how did it go? So thank you, Gus. Uh, good morning, for everyone. Uh, I I have uh, a short reflection on my experience in the field of sustainability. 
Uh, I will share with you my personal journey and the key point that I perceive as important for discussion, for this discussion. I think that we made the necessary change, which is good. Even so, I think we still have reserve. So I start with my personal journey. Uh, six years ago, I funded the startups investment fund Up21, and I started to invest in and to develop from missing startups. I was traveling to San Francisco, Chicago. I was building a business network and I was developing my innovation business. Thanks to my enthusiasm and my innovative approach, we got the organization of Startups World Cup in Europe. We set the trend not only in Czech Republic. One day, Zbigniew Machat from the Technology Agency of the Czech Republic came to me and indeed me to the food and invite me to the working group called Social Apps Responsible Research and Innovation. I accepted the, the invitation. Suddenly, the whole new world of the sustainable business opened in front of me with incredible investment volume you know, of 2,500 billion Czech Rome. I was fascinated by these possibilities. And I spent a year working for the evaluation jury on the New Horizon SME instrument in Brussels. In a sustainable, I saw a, a huge business opportunity. By the time I've been living in the countryside in the rural area of the Czech Highlands, I supported a small coffee farm in Tanzania in East Africa. And I started to notice that landscape was suffering and people living in the countryside are facing climate change impact. And there is a lack of understanding. I realize that I have the understanding, but I am using all my energy and time on profit making, only for profit making. It took me almost a year to make a decision to change my approach. I left my old world and set on a new journey. Today, it is already three years, I'm learning to do things differently, to make a positive impact in my region and society. <clears throat> and what I realized on my journey, to add the word sustainable is not enough, and it's time for courage because we are shaping, shaping the new world. Uh, next slide, please, Lucas. And this is my first point. What I mean by that, <clears throat> but it's simply, when I was making decision in my business world, I, and I, uh, I focus on, I focus on four key aspects. Is the startups ready for a fast acceleration? Is there a great team? Is there a strong story? Is there a good business opportunity in the horizon of two to three years? Today, when I pitch my startups to investors who claim to be focused on sustainability or social impact, they focus on the same aspects I used to. They just built a different portfolio of projects instead of looking or thinking out of the box. From my perspective, it's not enough. It's necessary to radically change the approach to the following, which startup to select for the portfolio, the way how to start up should be developed and add the real purpose focus, add to think about the impact of the startups on human life and add to things about profit in the long term. I think that it's time to go beyond status quo horizons and why Lucas, please, next slide. Yeah. Because I think that venture capital funds and their investments are shaping the future of the planet and the human society. And I think that it's time for courage, time to widen the scope of investment decision making process and focus more on the purpose. I think that this is uh, necessary, responsible, responsible shift in this 
in this area. And how we implemented this new thinking in my company, we sold our business only activities and start with uh, responsible project only. And we founded National Institute for Integrated Landscape of the Czech Republic, and we are creating visualization of the climate vulnerability on the municipality level and creating climate adaptation strategy. We create new methodology for change of mindset called Mind Snapshot. We use this for development, new type of integrated leaders. And together with Radek Hushek, we are working on the project called Planet Positive, which helps company approach sustainability from a climate change per perspective in a measurable, measurable way. And this is my new approach. And I think that it's time for change. <laughs> it's all, this is my short thinking about this terms. Thank you, uh, uh, Jan. It was a very, very interesting to follow your uh, your journey. Do you uh, do you think that age plays a role? <laughs> I, I think so, but uh, I also completed my bucket list. Yeah, so ah, all um, right. Yeah, and then I was thinking what to do next. I was looking for a meaning in my life. So I think that this combination was a game changer in my life. Yes, yeah, so age and my finish my bucket list. The combination is so game changer. <laughs> okay, so so here we go. Uh, uh, the the individual's uh, mental setup and and uh, stage in life apparently has uh, has uh, impact on uh, how we perceive impact. <laughs> there was a an attempt on a joke here. Now, uh, thanks, <laughs> thanks everyone for, uh, uh, for for their presentations, and uh, I would I would love to hear from our uh, uh, colleagues uh, from uh, the academic sphere. You know, who uh, are following closely not only what is happening um, in the uh, area of, of um, you know theoretical and and uh, uh, um, you know, data-based uh, um, understanding of uh, of responsibility impact, but also what's actually happening in industry and 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 the uh, entrepreneurial um, um, uh, community. So, uh, uh, Vincent, Alex, how do you uh, perceive this with what has been said today and what your research is saying? Do we have a new generation of um, investment and and new generation of of uh complementarity of um, uh, of those two sources of funding for research and innovation um whoever wants to speak first <laughs> please go ahead uh, alex you are the guest i'm part of this project <laughs> oh yeah Thank definitely you. yeah yeah please please go ahead yes thank you lucas yeah, it was a very interesting discussion, I think, uh, what we saw today. And I would like to, to, to bring it to a special point because my, my background is I was an entrepreneur myself. I also uh, do research and teaching on entrepreneurship and innovation and also RRI. So I have very different perspectives on this. And what I noticed in the recent years that the focus on the whole sustainability topics raised a lot in the awareness. But at the end, it leaves me with the so what question. Because what we heard earlier is, if you, if you, if you, if the customer doesn't care, <laughs> to put it in extreme words, and the investor doesn't care, so why should you do it? Because of your own motivation, as Jan mentioned, I think that's a, a very good motivation. But to really change the landscape, we we need a different approach to this. So my question is also to Katarina Borunska, for instance, how do you measure this? So if if I'm as a startup coming to you and applying, how do you measure? Is this an RI compliant startup? Is this something which supports your goals. And I think this is something we need to reflect upon to make a real change happen after all. Do you then want me to come in? Oh, definitely. We're, we're in the, in the discussion uh, part now. So yes, please do. Okay. 
So I think that there are two elements. You, you asked about measurement, but maybe before that, I will mention a bit about the, the selection process, because as I mentioned in the, in the presentation, there are a number of criteria against which applications are assessed. So now talking purely about the, the EIC, um, and these are excellence, impact, and then risk. So of course we want the, um, the, the projects to, to, to have you know, great innovation potential, um, be stand out from what already exists on the market, etc. But what is then also important is the impact and the broader impact they will have uh, in society, economy, but also environment. And all these three, let's say, criteria are, are weighted equally. Maybe that's something that you may criticize that actually you would like the, the broader impact to have more weight than the, the excellence or, or the risk element. Uh, I don't know, it came to my mind now. But then also the EIC as a program uh, will be uh, measured against a number of key performance indicators that were uh, suggested by the EIC pilot advisory board. And there, one of the KPIs, so actually the first one is that 90% uh, of the supported uh, companies should um, address sustainable development goals. Uh, and I saw that was also mentioned in, in the first uh, keynote speech. And if you look at the portfolio of the EIC companies, because the EIC is not actually completely new under Horizon Europe. We are already had a pilot since 2018. And uh, there was also the previous SME instrument. So we've already supported 6,000 uh, companies, many of which are, are contributing to, to the sustainable development goals, primarily in the health area, uh, health and well-being. I think about 34% energy, uh, sustainable cities, um, and, and there, there are many more. So this, that's how, what we look at internally. So you look at both the company and the product, what they are intending to use, right? Yes, so we are, we are assessing the, the project that they are putting forward, um, but the company itself as well, especially for the investment component, we are doing a due diligence on the actual company. Yeah, that's an interesting approach, but still, I would I would like to know from from Radek, uh, for instance, how do you uh, tackle this issue? Because I think it's challenging to have a sustainable product, uh, to have an RI RRI compliant uh, new product development process, and finding then customers who are willing to pay a higher price for the product. Okay, how how do you imagine the answer? <laughs> Whatever, whatever fits best to you. Because I'm, I'm, I'm curious when, when you go to an investor, for instance, how do you, how do you sell it that you are, that you are compliant to ethical issues? For instance, to say your, your, your product apparently serves to the United Nations Sustainability Goals. Um, uh, how do you sell this whole overall story? Okay. Yeah, I, I think, I think in terms of uh, startups that are in a seed stage, or for example, pre, pre, pre seed stage, we are still at the seed stage, our total funding is something like three, 3 million euros. Uh, so th this is basically a lot of investors, they bet on founders, they bet on the story. So it's a lot of times it's a, it's a short pitch and, and, uh, and you, you first time shake hands. So, so I think uh, there is th definitely a, a due diligence part, but I think for example, even in terms of our customers, uh, I think they just trust us. We are building also a brand. So this is really that uh, we wouldn't just um, like, like risk that, uh, that like we, we have certain trust of customers that we want to, that we want to really uh, attend to. And, uh, and for example, for the measurement, that's our next stage. We want to, in, in, in the next year, we, we want to, for example, focus more on really measuring uh, through life cycle assessment, our CO2. We want to work, for example, as I mentioned, with B, B corporations. So we see it as like a next step. And in the previous years of startups, it was a wild ride. And uh, it was more on really the trust of founders and the trust of the brands that, that our customers uh, see in. So hope I, it's, it's, it's a hard answer to give, I think, a bit. 
it was also a difficult question. <laughs> I guess I, I, I told you. Maybe, maybe my final one. This is just that that I think it's it's difficult if you talk to the customer in Germany. We have the lowest meat prices, I think, in Europe. And if you watch TV, you see advertisements about you know biological meat and how important it is that that you pay a high price, whatever. But if you look at the naked numbers, uh, you know everybody buys the cheapest available product. And I think this is still a big a big challenge to solve on the on the long term. But I guess Vincent has also interesting opinion on that. Yeah, shall I move uh, on, Lucas? Yes, please do. Please do. Okay. Uh, I will circle back to, okay, okay. to, to uh, the, the uh, Just later. interrupt me if I take too long. Um, I just wanted to make three uh, general remarks. The first one is that you uh, you cannot imagine how happy I am with a, with a session like this, because when I started to do research on responsible innovation in industry, most of the people were talking about the industry as the bad guys. They still often do, uh, but there was not there was no interest uh, in in the industrial context of responsibility uh, in relation then with innovation. Of course, there is business ethics, but that that's something different. So I'm very happy, and I also believe that is why I entered the scene because I I believe that that companies are often part of the problem, so to speak. If we talk about the transition to a sustainable society. They are actually part of the problem often, but they can be part of the solution. And the, the, the idea, what I, what I experience with businesses is that if they decide to, um, uh, to engage in responsibility, then they can really make the difference because we as researchers and policymakers, we have all kinds of high level ambitions, policies and that sort of things, but companies have to translate their responsibility in an end product that sells on the market, like like uh, like uh, uh, the speakers already indicated. So then the question is, of course, do they these companies uh, take responsibility? And here also, I'm very happy uh, because uh, we did uh, over the past few years. I I added this also to the chat uh, uh, material on this. Uh, yes, companies are motivated to take responsibility. That is not really the issue. Um, they even, uh, as we did in another re research project on the, in the EU research project, um, uh, many companies see responsible innovation as a competitive advantage. It can increase their reputation. It uh, increases their social license to operate. It can prevent uh, nasty rules and regulations, all that kind of things. So that's also great. We tick the box of, of responsibility, so to speak. That is not a, uh, a fundamental problem, problem either. And now, of course, the, the topic of today, namely uh, funding. And here it becomes a little bit more complicated. Uh, and I would like to refer to uh, recent research, which is not published yet, but that, that, that it is submitted at this moment. And we focused in research on venture capital. So we didn't look at the public funding that was represented also uh, by Katerina. Uh, that is, I think, a completely different uh, situation. But we are talking about venture capital. And here you see a little bit difficult issue, namely that these venture capital uh, uh, capitalists, and, and this is also mentioned by, by many of you, I frame it a little bit different. Uh, they often see a green idealist, uh, a person like uh, Radek, who is really willing to change the world by engaging in responsible business. Uh, but then the question is, how do I transform an idealist in an entrepreneur? And we know this is a problem for venture capitalists because this is the same type of experience they often have if they talk with a researcher. If there is a researcher with a patent, uh, a great technology, then uh, the, question, the main question is, is, is this entrepreneur able to make the shift from a researcher to an entrepreneur, to a money-making machine? Or is he or she still a researcher or an idealist? So this is a main issue that are, is often indicated by, by venture capital uh, 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 people that we interviewed also for this research. And that is, I would say, one of the main hindering factors um, that we should work on. Uh, and that would be also my recommendation to Katerina, not only to make, um, of course, I'm not sure whether that this is the case, but not only uh, provide 
um, funding, but also uh, uh, provide uh, uh, network facilities, uh, training programs, and that sort of things. Because, uh, and then I finish, what we also found, we because next to this issue of, of uh, transforming an, an, a research or an idealist in an, in an entrepreneur, we also uh, ask these venture capitalists, what, what are the hindering factors for you next to this huge issue of business, the, the, the business logic that is absent often? Uh, what is the main issue for you that, that is hindering? Um, and then you see that they often mention matching problems. So that means that VCs have a huge, huge network in the business, but not necessarily uh, in green innovators or startup companies. So that's an, another bubble or something like that. So there are matching problems. So if you want to do something, it's not sufficient to make money available, but maybe also to build networks so that these people can meet each other. Another uh, thing is maybe is connected is that the, the, these venture capitalists often mention that there is a lack of supply. So they say, yeah, we uh, we we would be we would be happy to invest in these type of companies if they are really uh, feasible, but they are not. We 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 do not encounter them. They do not come to us. Maybe they because they are not focusing on high tech. Maybe because they are not focusing on big, but only on small businesses. That is, I don't know. That is something to uh, to uh, to to explore further. But last uh, is issue, which is also mentioned by. Um, by several of the speakers, is that they say that the problem is a little bit that it's so difficult to define responsibility, like it's also difficult to, to uh, define social impact. Because if we want to connect responsibility with the money-making machine, as, as I would frame it, then we, on one, in one way or another, we should capitalize this responsibility in a brand, in a definition. We should be able to, to, to measure the extent to which this product is indeed more responsible, because then we can also ask a premium maybe for it. There are also other kind of things that are mentioned by Alex, uh, Alex already, that even if there is a premium, people are not willing to buy it. But, but I leave that problem here, because I now focus only on issues that are related or in the perspective of the VC uh, um, venture capitalist. So I would recommend also both also uh, your institution, Lucas, but also Katarina and others that are involved. Uh, I would say uh, we should work on these networks, skill development, if we really uh, want to take advantage of the competitive advantage and the motivation to take responsibility. Thank you for uh, listening. Thank you, uh, Vincent. And, and Martin, I, I was just going to, to, to give you the, the, the word. Uh, so are we are we seeing a compatibility or a compatibility issue? You know, the, the European level, our, you know, local level, we have co-funds, then, uh, you know, all of these issues of, you know, how long we should wait for this impact to take place and the profit to come in. So could you reflect on that a little? No, no, that was for you. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I just wanted to tell you uh, something about uh, my work in the agency and uh, uh, just to reflect what Vincent said. Uh, as uh, we have, uh, as I showed you, a uh, huge uh, financial investment from public money into the research and development in the agency. I went to the agency those uh, 12 uh, years ago from the business. And uh, actually, yes, the administration is very boring. Uh, but uh, you know what, what's uh, very interesting, and uh, uh, I, I see some miracles, I have to say, in the agency, is when you put uh, different pe people together, and uh, the more different people you put together, uh, the more interesting results you get. And uh, it's very interesting in our programs that uh, the most successful from the point of view of the impact are not the huge financial, huge programs supporting uh, many large projects, but the programs with a very, uh, very interesting and different ideas. 
Like I said about the program ETA, it's actually financially smaller program, but we put together uh, the, the, the social sciences, scientists and the people from companies sharing the experiences. And we see in those larger, huge programs for, for industrial research projects, and we see the companies asking the social sciences for uh, to be involved in, in, in their projects. And that's something very interesting. And that, that's uh, what, as I understand what, what Vincent said, that uh, to put the people together to support the environment uh, and uh, sh uh, support the sharing of experiences. And it's not, it's not entirely about the money. <laughs> it's about the continuous effort uh, to put the people together to share the experiences. And that, that's something what's very important. And, and we see the results in the agency after 12 years. Uh, and it's uh, very interesting. Mm, thank you. So uh, I had this, um, you know, the time related uh, question for everyone here. And maybe I, I would like to start with Milos. Uh, uh, Milos, how long does uh, an investment fund want to wait? <laughs> or how, how long are you willing? What's the, what's the time scope? And is it at all compatible with what, what maybe Katarina mentioned, like seven to 10 years, 15 years? I mean, I've never heard, a, a, you know, an investor being, uh, you know, uh, willing to, to wait for so long. So is it, is it really uh, um, something, uh, you know, that should go together with the, you know, VCs and, and, and seed funds and, and others in the ecosystem, giving it the initial push and then maybe seeking extra investment from uh, public funding? Or, how do you see this? Uh, first of all, I would like to react to Mr. Bob's uh, point that uh, VCs tend to tend to uh, have very few applicants, very few companies suitable. So that is a very good point by, by Mr. Vincent. And uh, uh, my point or my answer to this is very simple. It's due to lack of financing on the very beginning. So uh, yes, we have we have very few co new companies starting. We have very new companies, very few companies uh, applying for different funds. That's due that these these fundings require them to be a certain stage, and to get to this stage is basically like impossible in in, in local local terms. So uh, my answer and my recommendation to any type of panel, to any type of uh, uh, discussions I've ever had with with EIF or or any public agency is to increase funding for the very early stages. Uh, there are several means how to do this. Uh, yes, but the, the goal should be uh, to increase funding at the very early stages. And uh, to answer your question, uh, it depends on, on, on the type of VC. Actually, the whole VC industry is massively changing currently. Uh, the basic VC model that, that used to be very common in 10, 10 years ago, it's completely changing. Uh, VCs are starting to specialize heavily on certain areas because they know how to do them. Uh, and uh, there is a very, very huge dis disproportion between VCs, among VCs uh, in different countries, in different uh, cities, in different continents. So this very, very depends. In Czech Republic, I know a few VCs that are okay to have the company in the portfolio for seven, even 10 years, no problem. It depends on their strategy. It depends on their assessment, on how much resources they put into the company, not only, comp not only money, but also their time, they, uh, their uh, you know, contact, etc. how they build the business alongside the founders. So uh, if, you, if we are talking about, let's say, VCs that do uh, hands-off uh, approach, that, that means that there are very few of them in the fund and they do, let's say, 10, 20 investments per year, they cannot wait this long for a business to, to, uh, to uh, you know, emerge in seven years. They have to have the, uh, the, the quantity, uh, you know, being bought and sold. But if you're talking uh, about very specialized VC that have very few investments, but they invest heavily in these investments, as I said, not only with money, but also with, with their work and, and context, they can definitely have their the, this company in their portfolio for, for years. So, so as I said, it very depends. And also this change of, of we see is, uh, is not clear where it ends. It's, it's not clear how these funds will transform um, and where the shift will end. 
uh, I personally have also shifted from, from VC approach to a different type of approach. And uh, uh, I'm very curious about how the, the rest of the world will, will react on this because the VCs had its problems. Uh, on average, VC funds are not profitable. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's also a business that is not scalable because the local, uh, the local challenges for the startups to solve are extremely unique to a specific area, specific uh, locations. So uh, large funds, large VC funds, uh, that we know, we work from Vienna, etc. For example, they they try to expand, you know, to the East Sea uh, region to find new startups to invest to because they also lack new applicants. But they realize that they completely fail at, at, at expansion because they they just don't know or they 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 haven't had the experience with with local challenges. So, so uh, it's a very complex question and very complex topic. And uh, and but but as as uh, <laughs> As, as I, a libertarian, I have to say at the end, the, the market will always find its, its, uh, its route. Uh, having VCs, not having VCs, having uh, European and not having uh, European funding, the market will find its way. So uh, uh, I am curious myself and I will continue to watch this, watch this trend. Thank you, Milos. Uh, Alex, from your point of view, are these two sources of funding and do these two maybe sources of, of uh, uh, um, you know, motivation for being a responsible business, are they then converging? And are, you know, those these principles that we call RRI uh, any helpful in understanding each other for those two worlds? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. That's a good point. Actually, I think we, may, we might also do a mistake at our educational uh, angle because we have a social entrepreneurship program for social entrepreneurs, and then we have a high-tech entrepreneurship program for technology entrepreneurs. And the reason for this is because the, the, the way, at least for us to, to bring the social entrepreneurs with their motivation to the level where the technology entrepreneurs are is quite far. So we focus uh, differently because most of our social entrepreneurs, they, they, they really need to learn that making money is a, uh, also as important as having an impact on society or on their product. So the way is simply too long to bring them to people like uh, Milos uh, who wants to invest heavily in a, in a, in a product and a team. So this may be, may be a mistake we are doing um, if I think about it. Uh, but, but on the other hand, uh, I think also the awareness is, is raising a lot. And especially in Germany, we have many, maybe even in Southern Germany, maybe more the effect that many startups, they don't want to have investors. They say, I want to grow out of my pocket money. And, and I always tell them, you know, there's also a kind of dead end, right? So after five years, six years, you're not a startup anymore. If you go to Milos or some other colleagues say, well, you, you could have uh, showed up three years back, then we could have discussed, but not now. So I think it's also uh, interesting when and where should they apply. I will also send them to Katerina's program now to say, uh, take a closer look and, and apply there and try to try to match them. Um, and that, that's also another thing that we have maybe also too many opportunities out there where you can get funding from, starting from friends, fools, family, up to venture capitalists. And there you also have a big market, which is good at the one hand because it's worldwide fun available funding uh, uh, landscape. But on the other hand, it's also a problem because they are kind of overwhelmed. So I also agree that we need more this ecosystem thinking that we connect our startups with the right network. Uh, not only locally, but also beyond this. And that's a, that's a big challenge because at the end of the day, we should do research and teaching, right? So this is also, also a, a challenge for us, I think. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're uh, already some 10 minutes after the uh, official end of this session. And um, uh, it, it breaks my heart to, uh, to announce uh, the end, <laughs> but we are definitely uh, drawing near to it. So, um, Thank you all for coming and, and thanks uh, to uh, everyone for sharing their views and, uh, and uh, the understanding of, of where we are heading. Uh, I believe I will uh, speak for everyone uh, when I say that uh, we can definitely see uh, elements of, of convergence um, and definitely the thinking seems to be uh, much uh, clearer on both sides uh, after years of uh, of uh, intense uh, changes, 
public meaning uh, uh, pressure, uh, and of course uh, also um, the the interests of uh, of the capital, uh, and we can hope that uh, initiatives such as the New Horizon project, uh, bringing a more uh, understanding and and uh, well even I would say some common sense in how to support um, uh, responsible innovation and research. So uh, again, thank you very much for coming. Uh, we were uh, very happy to have you. Um, of course, you will find the recording um, uh, at the um, our YouTube channel and uh, uh, the, the materials that were shared in, uh, in uh, notes. Uh, that will be uh, published in the coming days. So, uh, thank you very much. Have a, a, a responsible uh, and uh, innovative weekend and uh, hopefully <laughs> the rest of your careers. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, greetings from Prague. Uh, we, we are uh, going to stay in touch. Please uh, check uh, the chat as well uh, for a, a link to our RRI ambassadors group on LinkedIn. We will be very happy to welcome you there. Most of the speakers are already there um, and uh, we will be uh, um, uh, keeping uh, the uh, we'll be keeping uh, the, the community alive, uh, uh, bringing uh, news and uh, an interesting uh, um, uh, things to, uh, to your attention there. So thank you and goodbye.